We are delighted that uh, Dr. Madhav Khosla has, uh, is with us today. He is a very busy teaching uh, schedule at, at Columbia University. And, uh, but we are very happy that he has found time to be with us. Uh, he is the Ambedkar Visiting Associate Professor at Columbia Law School. He is also an Associate Professor of Political Science at Ashoka University and a Junior Fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. He studied Political Theory at Harvard University where his dissertation was awarded the Edward M. Chase Prize for the best dissertation on a subject relating to the promotion of world peace. <coughs> and law at Yale Law School and the National Law School of India uh, University uh, in Bangalore. Madhav Kosala's interests range across the fields of public law and political theory, and much of his work is on the theory and practice of constitutionalism under conditions of rapid democratization, weak state capacity, and low levels of socio-economic development. His work has been cited by courts in India and other countries of South Asia. Uh, with these words, I hand over to Dr. Khosla. So please uh, uh, tell us about the Indian Constitution and uh, uh, what you feel about it and how it has defined uh, India and, and, and helped us in our nation. Thank you. Thank you. You will speak for about 15 minutes? Yeah. That's great. So I just thank you all so much for coming and I'm really grateful to the to the Counselor General for sort of working through the schedule so kindly and generously because sort of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are terrible days for teaching and they were really kind and accommodating me. Um, I think now, you know, India's had one of the few constitutions that's actually managed to last for such a long time. If we look at the post-colonial histories of other countries or if we see constitutions in general, the average lifespan of constitutions is under 20 years, right? And the Indian constitution is now, it's 70 years old. And so one of the interesting things for us to think about is what was the Indian founding actually about? What was special about it? What was unique about it? And one way in which we actually sometimes don't ask that question is we don't think that there's something that special about it, right? So whatever was done in a way was already done in the late 18th century with the American and the French revolutions, right? And then other countries are just following that path. And I don't quite think that that's right. I think that there's something special and interesting, even unique about the Indian founding. And I think people at the time understood that. So at, as the year 1946 came to an end, and Jawala Nehru introduced the aims and objects resolution in the Constitutional Assembly of India, he basically spoke, interestingly enough, with a hint of regret. And he said that, you know, one of the unfortunate legacies of the past has been that there's actually been no real understanding of the Indian problem. And what Nehru felt was that Indians were yet to grasp why their revolution was so important. He felt that actually it mirrored the American, the French and the Russian revolution in historical meaning. And in some sense, it was exceptional for the problem that it tried to solve. And I think that one of the things sort of, you know, to think about is that in the last sort of two or three decades, there's been an outpouring of literature around actually the justifications for empire, right, and British rule. And there's a lot of writing on that, and we even see that today, right, books on the East India Company, so on and so forth. But there's actually been less interest or less attention in the other side of the story, which is that we now know a lot of the arguments for why empire was justified, but we actually don't quite know how people, resp how Indians responded to the specific arguments on which empires were built. So one of the arguments on which empires were built was actually that a place like India is incapable of democracy. And it's incapable of democracy because it doesn't have the preconditions necessary for democratic rule, namely a certain kind of homogeneity in social and religious terms, or for example, um, a certain level of literacy or a certain level of wealth and a certain growth in administrative institutions. And one of the things that we might ask is that, look, a lot of us write about and think about how India is a surprising democracy, how it's an unlikely democracy, but how are Indians themselves thinking about this, right? So we have a lot of attention on, oh, you know, Ambedkar is interested in the problem of caste, Gandhi is interested in the problem of non-violence, but how were they actually thinking about democracy as well, right? Like, did it strike them that this is a strange place to have a democracy? Was it obvious? 
And I think that one of the remarkable features of the constitutional founding in particular, the debates from 46 to 49, and the constitution then is, um, is adopted, is finally comes into being in 1950, is the idea that you can actually create democratic citizens through democratic politics. That the path to actually creating a kind of democratic citizenship is by subjecting people to a certain kind of political life. And the way in which that's done is through a kind of constitutional architecture. And I think in the Indian system, what that constitutional architecture had is it had three elements, right? So it had a commitment to the rule of law. And so that itself was detailed in the constitution, right? The second is it had the idea of a state as a kind of central force through which modernity would be would come to being in India and it had an idea of representation, namely the way in which we are identified that was focused on individuals, right, rather than group identities. And the thought was that look, in each of these cases, if you actually allow this, then you could submit Indians to new forms of agency you, should, you could commit them to new kinds of information and this could convert Indians in a way to subject, from subjects into citizens, right? And I think that one of the interesting things about the Indian founding is that, you know, when colonial histories were written, right, in the 19th century, they were often written imagining India's past as being empty, as being uncivil, and there was a sense that, look, these are, India's a disordered place, and it's only an external authority, in that case the empire, that would impose some sense of order on this space that was full of anarchy, right? And one of the attempts at the time, there were many responses to this. So one response was, look, we have to write different kinds of histories. And in some sense, Nehru's discovery of India is the most ambitious attempt at this, right? Nehru had long acknowledged that basically the, the biggest sin of colonial rule had been to create a kind of slave mentality in India, right? And so the discovery of India, which is a text written largely in jail, right, where Nehru spent almost 10 years, was basically an attempt to give a very different account of India's past that would function without external authority. But there was also a sort of attempt to say that, look, you need to constitute and create India on different terms. You're going to have to build a structure that can do something different. And that task fell, that basically fell upon the founders of India's constitution, right? Now, whenever we think about the history of constitutionalism, we often think about different moments and we think that each of those moments has done something special. So if we think about the American founding, if you ask anybody, right, what's the American founding about? A lot of them would say, look, it's about separation of powers. That's an important principle. It's about actually whether you can have large versus small republics, what is ideal. It's about whether you can have a kind of civic reciprocity without a monarchy, right? This is the big attempt. And I think similarly, what's special about the Indian founding is an attempt to bring into focus a very specific set of issues. And India, ex that I think those issues are, lie at the heart of the post-colonial constitutional moment, which India exemplifies. And it then comes into being across Asia in the 1950s and Africa in the 1960s, right? And what is that post-colonial moment about? So I think the post-colonial moment is about the fact that constitution making and democratization are occurring at the same time. So unlike in the West, where the suffrage is extended gradually, so you're not really worried actually about people who you think can't manage in political life, how do they be, because they don't have the vote, right? So you're not, it's not a concern. Whereas here, you're actually instituting democracy and you're, in, and you're at the same time as which you're writing the constitution. And the question becomes that then what do you put into the constitution to meet this problem? And it's not only that constitution and constitution making and democratization are happening at the same time, it's that they're happening at a place that is poor and illiterate, that's divided by caste, religion, language, and that's burdened by centuries of tradition. Right? Now, in the West, what happened was very different. In the West, the historical part of countries saw improvements in prosperity, stronger administrative systems, and then franchise was extended. Right, uh, So, universal franchise came after a reasonable level 
of income had been secured and some administrative systems have been built, right? And I think in that sense, the birth of modern India is in some ways the defining democratic experience of the 20th century, right? Now, this is even more surprising if we think about the first half of the 20th century where democracy ended up as being a complete failure in Europe in the interwar period. All of the, all of the continental empires that became democratic basically collapsed, right? And, in, and this was not lost on India's leaders. I mean, a number of India's leaders often worried about, were worried about whether democracy could work. And the interesting thing is, you know, when Clement Attlee, the British Prime Minister, writes to Nehru in 1949 to say India should join the Commonwealth, one of the arguments that he gives is he says, look, you people need a king. You can't actually survive without a monarchy, right? Because Asian people can't. And he specifically uses that term. And so a number of other people would also make these observations. You know, there's a fascinating British activist and thinker, Philip Spratt, who spent years in, um, in India. And one of the things that he says when the Indian constitution comes into being, he said, look, this is a terrible idea because this is a liberal document on a country that's not liberal, right? And so it's not going to work. And um, and so the interesting thing about that particular moment, right, is that what is it precisely that gave these people that kind of force, right? And nobody, so you know, there's a there's a famous Cambridge lawyer at the time, Ivor Jennings, who's um, he's in Cambridge. He's very involved in drafting the constitution in Ceylon. He gives these lectures in Chennai on the new constitution in 1951. And he says, look, Indians should seriously consider not having universal suffrage, right? And throughout, in the British reports that come out, whether it's the report on constitutional reforms in 1918, it's the report of the Indian Statutory Commission in 1930, there's an attempt to say that, look, actually, the people are not ready to vote. And there's something going on here which doesn't work. And the Indian constitutional founding is a, is a decisive sort of rejection of that, right? Now, you realize, I mean, we notice that both for the major figures at the nationalist movement, right, whether it's Gandhi, whether it's Nehru, whether it's Ambedkar, they, they speak in universalistic terms, right? The Indian anti-colonial struggle was a universalist movement. And there was a sense that, look, what does it mean to limit the franchise to poor people in a country like India where most of the people are poor? Then you might as well not have democracy at all. Right? But the interesting thing about it is that, so the, the debate for India's elite, <coughs> political elite in a sense, was not a debate about whether you could actually limit democracy. That didn't really seem to be an option in 1950. <coughs> but there was an option over actually how you should do it, right? What should you do? Like, how do you in fact address this problem? And the Constituent Assembly, as we know, right, was basically a body that came into <coughs> in 1946 under the Cabinet Mission Plan. The Cabinet Mission Plan then fails. The Muslim League boycotts the Assembly initially. There's partition. Basically, after partition, the Congress is running the show, right? It's got over 80% in the Constituent Assembly. Bodies largely indirectly elected based on elections to the provincial legislatures. In fact, Ambedkar, who's such an important figure, right, doesn't even have a place in the assembly and he only gets in because the Congress decides to give him a ticket and Gandhi's generosity, right, is that, look, this is a moment where you don't need, you need the smartest people. And so we know who the major figures are, right, and the interesting thing is even in the assembly debates, you have these moments where people are sort of completely overwhelmed by the problem of universal franchise, right? So there are people who are saying, look, this is an impractical endeavor. This is a monstrous experiment. This is not going to work, right? And the interesting question is that none of us have actually quite noticed that. Like, in a lot of situations, what's happened is that when we talk about the Indian founding, we don't really think of that as being something very special, right? And I think that it's important, I mean, just today and in general, right, when you're thinking about India's constitution, I think what's important isn't only to say, oh, the document had ABC features or, you know, federalism or secularism or so on and so forth, but actually what it also had it, it, it had an idea that, look, ultimately the citizens that you get can be created through politics. Right? That politics itself will be the vehicle of creating a certain kind of citizenship. And so there's a sense in which 
you can liberate Indians from their earlier forms of association. You give them a state and that will liberate them from their earlier bonds and pressures of society. Right? You actually give them a framework of rules, it will liberate them from other ways in which they used to associate like kinship relations. You give them representation based on individuals and it will liberate them from other sort of ways in which actually um, you could, you know, you would actually look at people, which was historically through group identities. And so I think part of the story here, right, the story of the rule of law, a centralized state, individual representation was a story that, look, you can liberate Indian citizens by putting them in a new institutional framework and people would behave differently in that institutional framework, right? And I think that that's, that's quite a new idea, right? Because it's the, it's the historical moment in world history where democracy, constitution making and modernity actually take place at the same time. Right, and that doesn't happen at any moment. So it's sort of a very set, you know, in the in the West, there are a set of processes: the introduction of popular authorization, the creation of rules, the concentration of state authority, the identification of individual freedom, the separation of the public and the private, which are all happening at different moments of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. And in India, they're all happening at one moment, right? And so the interesting thing is, what do you get? Right when you do that, right, and how is that even? How does that sort of story even function? And I think that that's, I mean, for me, I would say that that's always been a central feature of the Indian constitutional experiment, right? Because the thought has been that actually, you can that politics itself is a form of education, right? And so the idea is that what was wrong in the imperialist imagination was not the idea that you needed to educate the people, but what was what was wrong was the idea that you had to educate them through imposing foreign rule and actually through the rule, through submitting them to some alien forces. It was that, the idea was that if you can create a self-sustaining politics, that itself will, will provide the education that you're looking for. So I think I'll just stop there and then we'll... Yeah. So, uh, no, I am quite uh, impressed by what you said and uh, one point which I uh, would like to reiterate is that uh, in the West, uh, various things happened over a period of time, even the separation of church and state and uh, private and public right. and, and uh, rights and universal suffrage and uh, we in India try to do everything at the same time. So, uh, the logical question is that in your uh, analysis, uh, how has India fared in the last 70 years as far as uh, the ideals of the uh, founding fathers were concerned? What is your view on that? I mean, look, I, I, I mean, my honest view is that, and just is the story is not great, right? And, and my honest view is, is that the story isn't very terrific. But I think that what's interesting is that I think one of the at least the question I ask is not how we are doing today, but how did we even survive so long? And I think one short answer to that question is actually Nehru. And I think the remarkable feature of Nehru is this, that he's the one person who realizes that what's important isn't the constitution, because no document can be self-executed. What matters is what is your external commitment to the document, right? And here's a moment where you have somebody over 17 years, right, who basically is committed to the idea that I'm not going to arrest people at night. I'm going to have 105 people but still run to parliament. I'm going to, I'm going to, so I, I think that there are some ways in which the system has worked well, right? And I think it's one of the things that a lot of us think is that, look, one of the ways in which Indian democracy has succeeded is by and large Right, despite controversies, but despite issues, it's had elections that by and large have been free and fair. And that's not a small achievement at all. I think what's been much more underwhelming is the story of Indian democracy between elections. Right? And I think that that's, have we done the other things, right? So have we managed to actually ensure a free press? Have we managed to ensure public institutions that function independently? Have we managed to have a civil service with the degree of autonomy that it deserves? You know, these things, right? And so the question is that these are hard things for any country. 
and I'm not sure that these are things that are solved by the constitution, right? These are ultimately things that rest on external political commitment. And I think one of the things about the post-colonial, the years after, is that, look, that commitment remained, right? And then at different points in Indian history, it's waned, right? I mean, it's waned at moments in the 70s. Some people are concerned with what's happening now. And so, you know, like we, and so I, I think that in some way, it's, I think the story is, like in many, like in this country, right? In some things it's done well, and in some things it's not. It's a mixed uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, mother.